Morning, everybody. Morning. <laughs> That's a very Friday morning morning there. Morning. <laughs> All right. Let's see what we've got today. Oh, I've got a whiteboard. I don't know about that. Uh, anyway. Let's see what we got. Let's get a chat up before that disappears. Mm -mm -mm. I need a larger laptop screen. Stick that down there. Where are we at? All right, so I figured that um, we've got Enceladus and a little look at Triton left to do today. Uh, and I will use next Friday to do the, and the Friday, the next Monday, sorry, to do the acrylonite. Uh, uh, brain's not working today. Um, to do the halophile, psychrophile uh, stuff. Uh, to give that the the time that it deserves, that's a good that's a good kind of lectures worth of material. So I don't think there's a pressing need to crack on and do it today. Um, so what I want to do is just see if anyone has any questions about Titan. So things that popped up from the lecture on Wednesday that didn't make sense, or any clarifications that you want. Uh, or even if you want to watch that video too, um, I'm all ears, figuratively speaking. Has anybody seen Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, that's a good movie. Yeah, my kids think I look like the dad. My eyebrows. <laughs> So when I'm surprised, like you see my eyeballs. <laughs> anyway, makes me laugh. Um, questions, anybody? Anything? This is your moment to speak. Or well, one of many, obviously. Mm. Has anybody had a chance to see that uh, Huygens probe video. Yes, no, is anybody there? I'm here, <laughs> I'll look at it over the weekend. <laughs> and I have right. a lot of questions on Monday. <laughs> oh, no worries. Uh, well, let's just watch that, there you go. That would kind of get people's mental juices flowing a little bit. Uh, and kind of perk people up a touch. And it's just a cool, uh, it's a cool video right, as well that's worth watching. Now, I don't know whether you can, let me know if you can hear the, the sound, because I can, but I don't know whether you can. Can you hear that? Anybody? No, not on my end. Hmm. How about that? Uh, it's way too bad to make anything out. It's just like noise. For me, crab sticks. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I had this problem the other day with um, uh, playing a video to my genetics class, and it just absolutely sucked. CC. What does CC mean, Mariah? Closed captioning. Oh, okay. Sure. How do I do that? Uh... Oh, there we go. Huh. I'm so glad I have you lie around. I don't know what I'm doing otherwise. 
All right. Well, I'll listen to the film. You can listen to it on your own uh, on your own time if you if you want. So essentially, what they're doing is they're showing um, a look back, essentially, right? So this is uh, the sun. Obviously, it's got a whole ton of filters over it so that you can actually see anything. Um, but this is a um, essentially what it would look like if the uh, the view back from the probe. And so um, the Earth and the Moon is actually passing in front of the Sun, which is which is pretty cool. So just to get the the point across, they're using a parachute, right? This is something that is almost uh, alien-like because this means it has an atmosphere that's dense enough to slow something down sufficiently using a parachute that it doesn't crash in and break into pieces as it hits the surface, right? So Titan has an atmosphere that's actually denser than the Earth's by quite a fair bit, about 50% denser, right? And so this is, it's actually far, far denser than Mars, right? Mars is a real pain in the ass to get things to because uh, it has such a thin atmosphere that you know you're limited by the um to the mass of the things that you can actually land there using parachutes because otherwise it just won't slow down enough um and yet here 10 au out from the sun you know there's actually a probe which is able to land using a parachute right and so that just kind of gives you a sense of how uh weird this place is So also this is real video, right? This isn't a simulation. This isn't like pretend. This is actually what the the, the probe sees. And uh, what they're just about to tell you is on the left here um, are what they think are an array of essentially petrochemical dunes, right? So these are dunes where the, the grains of, you know, sand essentially are formed from uh, petrochemicals and they think they actually have an electrostatic charge too which is a little scary good job there's not much oxygen around so again at the at the top you can see so those dots there are just the ordinal points you know compass points essentially um but the probe is now going down through that photochemical smog layer, right? So this is the layer where uh, a lot of those uh, UV um, carbon nitrogen uh, interactions occur forming those tholins, right? So that's what that, that layer is made up of is, you know, basically organic compounds and those then fall uh, dependent on their mass and you know other properties uh, down to the surface to coat uh, tight in the surface so that photochemical smog is one of the reasons why it's so hard to view the surface of the moon right as well as how uh, thick its atmosphere is
So again, just to uh, oh yeah, uh, petrochemicals as in um, chain. You know, not not. I don't think they're super long chain uh, hydrocarbons, but they are uh, chained hydrocarbons like ethane. Uh, what's one bigger than ethane? Propane. Um, you know, stuff like that uh, as solid. Um, solid compounds on uh, form these dunes so does that answer your question yes sir yeah i was like, i'm sure i didn't call them metro, <laughs> metro <laughs> chemicals. Auto text. yeah and so um i just paused it to point out the fact that you know there's erosion right on the surface of uh titan right you can see uh kind of where i'm pointing with my cursor uh, what looks like a stream or riverbed, right? If you look at these features, even though like the perspective's a bit weird because of the camera um, uh, angle, essentially, uh, and you see it kind of changes out. So it's not quite as hilly as it appears just because of a, an artifact of the camera. But you can see that there's a, a definitive network of uh, eroded, channels and so that can't be produced by water that's got to because there is none or very little actually on on titan um at least in the liquid form uh it's produced by that methane and ethane which collects into those lakes right so there's enough of that happening that it actually causes erosion features exactly the same as what you see on mars Right, it's just that in Mars that happened, I don't know, a billion years or more ago. Uh, whereas on Titan it's happening kind of now. So you can see those dunes out on the right. And so another thing which didn't occur to me until uh, just now is that if these dunes are forming in lines, then what's causing those lines to form, right? On earth, that's caused by the action of the wind picking up grains and moving them uh, in a particular direction. And so what's forming that on, on Titan? Does it presumably it has winds, right? I don't know where those come from or what they're created by. Um, but otherwise, you wouldn't expect to see those, you know, ordered regimented structures. So that suggests, even though I haven't actually read anything about it, that Titan also has winds as well, which kind of makes you said sense. They had a, you said they had electrostatic charge. Do you think it has anything to do with how charged they are? Um, I don't know. Uh, the the electrostatic charge uh, stuff, I haven't actually come across that information again in my reading. That was something that I learned when I was uh, either taking or teaching this back when I was at Whitman College. So yeah. that was, uh, you know, um, four years or so ago. Um, so that's just like a, a, a nugget of information that's in my head, but I, can't actu I haven't actually found much information about that. Okay, gotcha. I'll have I'll have a look into it, see what I can find. Um, so yeah, that might actually have the um the fact that it has some kind of electrostatic charge may be involved in its form formation of those regimented dunes, but um, I don't know. Right, and and I only know how dunes are formed on Earth, which is through through wind, and obviously they're not. Yeah, it's probably more likely that it's wind. Yeah, but then that implies that there are winds, right? And <laughs> yeah. You know, and so I, I don't know whether the, the, I haven't read anything about that either. And I said it didn't come up in the, the info about the Huygens probe. So I don't know. I mean, it's kind of a mystery. It's, it's funny actually as well, because as you'll see when we look at uh, Triton, 
we kind of become used to having all of this information, right? Like these things are just over there, like you're, you know, going to El Paso or something, right? Um, but all the information that we have of these places comes from these missions, right? So the only reason why we know so much about Enceladus and uh, Titan is because of the Cassini mission. When you look at the, the stuff we know about Triton, all that we have are pictures from the Voyager 2 probe, which has gone and disappeared out of the solar system. And so it's, uh, it's almost like that kind of sense of uh, intellectual complacency. It's like, oh, you know, we know all this stuff. Um, whereas before those things got there, we didn't know anything about these places. We knew like next to squat about Titan and we certainly didn't know anything about Enceladus. You know, so um, it's kind of interesting to get questions like that because, you know, you think that, well, we must know that information, right? Because we know all this other information, but uh, I don't know, it's not necessarily the case. Anyway, I know that's kind of more of a philosophy of science kind of discussion than anything. And that's why we're here. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Get this, this is crazy. So I wanted to, to, to also look at the screen, you'll see like waviness, right? Distortion in the image. That's because of the, the it has a lamp, which is, you know, uh, shining down to the, the surface. So essentially when these missions are planned, a whole bunch of scientists get together and go, oh, you know, I think such and such. So we're gonna design a, a, a probe or something to test such and such right and so actually I saw a talk by uh, one of these scientists whose um, experiment was a little uh, I don't know if it was a electrical or pneumatic or what like a little ram and all it was to do is once the Huygens probe got to the surface it was to go stunk like that that was it because they wanted to measure the um, density of the crust that the probe was sitting on, right? You know, and so the way to do that was to fire a bolt into it and kind of see how much that material resisted the, the pressure of the bolt, right? And so he, you know, I mean, part of his career was built on that one thing and the experiment lasted for 30 seconds, right? But it took seven years to get there. Um, and so one of the experiments was, well, let's put like a little heat lamp, you know, a halogen bulb or something, right, on an arm. And so they uh, turned that on, or it got turned on, right, because obviously the communications lag is kind of crazy. Um, and uh, they wanted to see whether that would melt stuff, right? I don't know whether they collected the gases or what. Um, maybe they did. I, I don't know that degree of detail. Um, but you can actually see the gas, which is almost certainly methane and maybe some uh, water vapor kind of uh, wiggling up the screen from that heat lamp, right? So if you look to the top left, you can actually see that. 
So you see that rippling? And that is something melting and uh, condensing on the, the, the surface. I've right, got a dew drop. See, over here. And that, let's just get it back here. That's what the sun looks like from Titan. Isn't that crazy? I mean, I've, I, you know, like, I don't know about any other uh, kind of science geeks out there, but that, that's super, super cool. So anyway, uh, you know, if you have time, uh, watch that yourself. You get to listen to some nice, like, parlor music and stuff. Um, but it's, it's an absolutely crazy place. It really is. And we don't even know what form of ice these ice rocks are, whether it's kind of standard ice one like we have here on Earth, or if it's kind of some of those funky ices that you find um, kind of deeper into uh, those other moons like on Ganymede and deeper into to Titan. Any already got any questions about the video? If, uh, if you do. Oh, I think it's pretty mind blowing personally. Uh, it's kind of the, I don't know, it's the one of the most amazing things that I've seen. Anyway, so um, moving on, let's go on to uh, Enceladus, right? So where's our, here we go. So if we move these things around so you can see what I'm pointing at. Right, so here's Titan. It's uh, not too far from from Saturn. It's close enough that you can actually see uh, Saturn uh, transit in front. Of, uh, sorry, Titan transit in front of Saturn. Um, but Enceladus is really close, and it's actually, I think, inside Titan uh, uh, Saturn's magnetosphere. I think I'm not 100 percent sure about that. But uh, you can see uh, the rings of Titan here, right? Those are just the most visible rings. There are actually rings that extend much further out. They're just harder to see, particularly from the way above the uh, elliptical. So uh, Enceladus is actually in another ring called the E-ring, right? And the E-ring is actually in part formed by Enceladus, right? Which is uh, kind of weird to think about. And the reason why it's formed by Enceladus, I'm just moving these things over a little bit. I don't need to look at what I'm, I look like, right? Pretty familiar with that. Um, the reason why Enceladus is so interesting is because it's quite analogous to Europa. So this is what, ah, crab apples. There you go, move that even further out there. This is what Enceladus looks like, right? So it is kind of similar to uh, Europa. It's an ice ball. It is actually the most reflective place in our solar system. If you remember way back early when we were talking about albedo. So uh, Earth has an albedo of about 0.3, give or take. And uh, Enceladus is 0.95. So it reflects back almost all light that hits its surface, right? Which obviously means it's going to be fairly cold on the surface. Um, and kind of analogous to Europa, although Europa actually has fewer craters, I think it has more of a um, ice sheet tectonics going on, whereas Enceladus is a lot smaller, um, probably doesn't. But uh, you have a few craters, not a huge number, but a few. And you also have these cracks, right? These kind of smooth sheets of ice uh, with a whole range of cracks and crevices kind of going across them. And the, the bits of most interest 
are down here. So you see at the bottom there are these four parallel stripes. Those are called the tiger stripes. I don't know why. Maybe because I think that make, looks like a Siberian tiger or something. And those stripes are cracks. They're called solsi, um, plural, or solsus is a uh, singular. And those cracks are hundreds of miles long uh, vents to the inside of Enceladus. And so if you look at it, I'm not sure what form this image in. Maybe this is uh, like a radar image. I'm not 100% not sure. I need to, need to check. But if you look at uh, Enceladus with the kind of type, this is like the southern hemisphere of Enceladus that we're looking at. So we're looking at it kind of up from, from the bottom, so to speak. Uh, but if you look at it from the side, you'll actually see these uh, plumes shooting out of Enceladus for a few hundred miles, right? They go out. And actually, the E-ring, which Enceladus is part of, right, as it goes around uh, Saturn, the E-ring is formed of particles that have been expelled from Enceladus, right? So they're not uh it's not created as like a leftover of accretion right the material that didn't uh kind of get sucked in to form titan or its moon uh saturn or its moons uh it's not likely to be um the result of uh subsequent impacts and asteroids and you know collisions and things like that it's from enceladus right so one of the rings of saturn is formed of material mostly small uh, ice grains, but also things called nanoparticles, which are presumably small particles, um, that are continually being ejected from those tiger stripes, right? And so without a shadow of a doubt, that tells us that there is liquid water underneath this icy surface of Enceladus. And so I'm just gonna kind of scooch ahead a little bit and show you what that come on looks like so this is what though this is a uh, captured by the cassini probe right so it actually flew by very close uh, and it flew by several times as well um, during the course of its uh, mission around saturn and in profile you can actually they look like jets right so all of this light stuff this is the light from the sun obviously uh so sun is kind of that away um you can actually see what looks like jets it's like it's such an alien uh kind of image it really is in fact with the green it looks a little bit like one of the eggs from aliens uh, if you remember the kind of cover yeah, art it does. Film. Mm -hmm. a little bit of sci-fi injected there so these aren't actually plumes or jets like they are on Europa because they're more, on Europa it's more uh, plumes from cryovolcanoes, generally speaking, not always, but mostly. Uh, here on uh, Enceladus, they're actually like curtains, right? Because these are cracks and they, they overlay the cracks here on uh, the image on the right. And so when you look through like a, a curtain of water from a particular like oblique angle, it looks like it's a solid jet, right? But it isn't, right? So this is just a kind of a uh, observational artifact, essentially, of how we're viewing those curtains. Hey, Robertin, you're too slow, man, too slow. It's up here. There you go. Acrylonitrile. It's a word of the day, as that was what uh, Robertson was asking about. I'm ahead of you. <laughs> I was actually thinking about that before I started the, the chat. Um, it's a, a funky nitrogen carbon hydrogen compound that's found, I think we know it's found, I'm pretty sure it is, on uh, Titan. And it can form uh self-assemble into vesicles in the same way as um phospholipids can so 
a very uh, strong argument for um, at least the compartmentalization first aspect of origins of life. Anyway, um, yeah, so getting back to this, this uh, material shoots out at crazy speeds, like hundreds of miles an hour. So there's an incredible amount of pressure inside of Enceladus that's forcing that out. And that again is generated by tidal flexing because it has a, um, a elliptical orbit uh, around, um, around Saturn. And obviously Titan is massive enough that it kind of tugs Enceladus out every time it uh, orbits past it. So when you look at those uh, sulci in close up, this is kind of what they look like, right? So they're these long, long cracks, right? So these pictures are taken in 2008. And also Cassini, again, because of, I don't know how they've come up with these ideas, right? Of what instruments to put on these probes. But some bunch of scientists thought it would be a good idea to put an infrared camera on, uh, on Cassini. And so they're actually able, this is a 2008 flyby, this is a 2009 flyby, which was closer and uh, yeah, just a lot closer essentially. Um, and so if you can compare back here, right? So this is the Damascus, Baghdad and Cairo solstice. I don't know why they're um, named after places in the Middle East, but you know, good as any. Um, it must be, <laughs> it's actually kind of round like that. I can't actually turn my image. I can only turn my laptop, which doesn't help very much. So if you rotate the, the image by uh, about 100 degrees, it will map onto what we're seeing here, right? So it's just a different change of perspective. Anyway, um, these are heat maps. Um, both in the literal and also the technical sense to show areas that are much warmer, right? So um, I think Cassini, uh, sorry, the surface of Enceladus is very, very cold. Can't remember uh, exactly how cold, actually. Let's look it up. Uh, ba Oh, chilly. It's two, minus 200 degrees Celsius or minus 330 Fahrenheit. I really hate Fahrenheit. Anyway, um, the temperatures here and the, the brighter the color, the, the warmer the area correspond to about minus 140 Fahrenheit, right? So uh, twice the temperature. I'm not sure if it really works that way. But what, you know, much higher or less than half as cold, there you go, as the surrounding ice. And uh, certainly warm enough if the water underneath it is salty for that water to be liquid, right? So not only can you see these actual plumes, but if you look at it with infrared, you'll actually see these kind of regions of uh, hotter, hotter ice essentially uh, corresponding to those cracks, which I think is, is really, really cool. And you can even in close uh, range, you can see those various cracks and folds in the, the ice surface. So there's even cooler stuff going on with Cassini because uh, there are two bits of evidence about what lies underneath that ice. The first is that what was once underneath that ice is now in you know in that e-ring around saturn and so uh, cassini obviously flew through that and it detected uh basically these silicate nanoparticles so right tiny tiny grains of silica and uh, according to scientists uh those can only form uh, in an interaction between water and rock at about 90 degrees Celsius, right? There's, there's no other way that they know of that those things can uh, come to be, right? So that tells us 
that almost certainly, and I'll just get over here, underneath the, the surface of this icy crust, which is still pretty thick, there must be water in contact with rock and that must be warm, right? So that's, you know, that's pretty cool because that does suggest that there are hydrothermal vents on the sea floor of uh, Enceladus. The second really cool piece of information that uh, we got was Cassini was actually able to fly through one of these plumes, right? So I don't know how they managed that, but they were able to change the orbit of uh, Cassini around, uh, around Saturn. So it actually was able to fly directly through one of these, you know, hundreds of miles high plumes. I'm not sure if that was the exact one. And then it was able to sample what it found in those plumes. And what it found was a very large amount, a uh, much higher density of uh, methane and simple and complex organics, right? And so these brackets are kind of what you might find in comets, right? So, you know, frozen balls of uh, ice and rock. And so the methane is like way to the top end of what one would expect. And um, there's also a whole bunch of kind of other stuff in there too. And so essentially like there's a big question, well, how can it have so much methane in it, right? Because, uh, you know, where is it coming from? And so they think that there's um, essentially a lot of methane in the, the liquid ocean right and that's trapped in what's called clathrates and clathrates are like ice lattices uh, we actually have uh, methane clathrates on on earth deep in the ocean um, which they're really worried about them melting because they'll release an awful lot of methane and methane is a very potent greenhouse gas um, but that can't explain how there's so much methane getting ejected and the only way to really explain that is that the hydrothermal vents essentially are creating huge amounts of methane which saturates the ability of the ocean to form those clathrates and so the excess is left le lost sorry um through those water vapor plumes right so so essentially this is a um a fairly well supported model based on the evidence that we have so far that a the the subsurface ocean it's got to be salty right because there's no way that it would stay liquid if it was just pure water but that subsurface ocean is in contact with the rocky core of Enceladus now if you remember back to uh, Europa and Ganymede those are open questions. We don't know that, right? Because we have no way of we have no way of knowing that essentially, right? So that's a really interesting uh, uh, observation, right? Because that would provide potentially the sources of energy and electron-rich compounds and warmth and so on, right? That you need to have life emerge, right? As potentially it did on earth and around hydrothermal vents um and then uh secondly that there's a constant production of uh methane from or via those um hydrothermal vents right and there's kind of detailed down here it's essentially an interaction between water and uh olivine which is a uh, kind of like a silica containing rock as far as I can remember um, so that's a pretty exciting place right and so if you think about you know like top ranking potential source sites at least for uh, evolution of life other than on earth you know Enceladus is way up there right so Enceladus, Titan, Europa are like the top three essentially and it's astonishing, really, from just the actions of one probe, how much we know about Enceladus, right? I think it's uh, super cool. So obviously, uh, astrobiologists and astrophysicists are 
kind of going nuts about you know all the different missions that we could send to these places to kind of follow on from what we now know about them that we didn't know before and really as well the the cassini and the galileo missions they completely remade um planetary science right the the amount of information about these places that they provided us completely turned a lot of theories on their heads because we just didn't have enough other information all we knew about really until those were uh, venus and mars right and so essentially we now have all these other data points uh, as well as obviously all the information we know about um, jupiter and saturn as a result anyway so enceladus is a super cool place not anywhere near as like sexy as Titan is, because uh, Titan is just crazy balls. Um, but Enceladus is arguably a more likely place to find life than Titan is. Partly because of these uh, warm hydrothermal vents on the ocean floor. Does anybody have any questions about Enceladus? No. It's a Friday morning thing. Okay, so uh, just to wrap things up, uh, go on. A, Wait, I have a question. Uh, oh, Kiara, Kiara. <laughs> By the way, learn? this isn't this isn't about sending like bacteria on a probe to Enceladus. No, 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 no. But it's close. Um, <laughs> would you live on Enceladus if we could? Um, I don't think you'd be able to. It'd be too cold. I but mean, it, if 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 I could. I don't know, what would you do? I mean, it would just be like sitting inside watching Netflix all the time, right? I mean, that's what we're doing now, right? Yeah, like that's so different <laughs> from our current situation. <laughs> Lots of ice skating. That's oh, yeah. right. Yes, you know, if, you, if you didn't freeze to death almost in, instantly first, then... I mean, don't forget, right? As cold as, like, the coldest depths of an Antarctic winter, right? It's so cold that they evacuate people from like the Ross Ice Shelf and places like that, apart from the skeleton crew of crazies, right, that stay there over winter, the coldest yes. that, that gets is minus 60 degrees Celsius, right? And that is bloody miserable. I've been at minus 40 degrees Celsius, and it is miserable, right? Your nostrils freeze together, your eyes start freezing, you know, you start looking like a drunkard almost immediately because your blood vessels pop in your nose and stuff um enceladus is minus 200 right so it's very 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 cold um so i wouldn't want to go to uh enceladus too cold man you know i'd want to go to like venus nice and toasty but you burn up like immediately <laughs> yeah well, i mean that's kind of the downside there aren't really many places other than earth which would be particularly nice to go to to be honest you know if one were thinking of a holiday I have one, uh, more, one more question. All right, and then I'm going to ask uh, uh, answer Robertson's. Okay. What's up, Kara? Um, I know this isn't relevant, but <laughs> but you wear shorts in the winter time, so wouldn't this be like right up your alley? Well, I mean, there's there's like ranges, right? So you know, if you grow up in in the north of the U.S. or in the U.K., you know, Texas is pretty warm year round, right? But that doesn't mean that I mean, I, I personally, I really want to go to Antarctica. I mean, it, it's kind of a little bit of a sadness of mine that I work on things that don't typically live in Antarctica, <laughs> right? Um, and so I'd probably have to go as a tourist unless I could wrangle my way as a scientist of some sort. Um, but yeah, I'd love to go to Antarctica. It's just like this totally alien uh, place uh, for a short visit, you know, like a month yeah. or something. And then I go back somewhere warm where I'm not going to be worried about my fingers dropping off if I uh, forget my gloves, right? And and that's that's nowhere even like even slightly close to as cold as Enceladus. I mean, Mars is cold, right? That gets down to uh, I think it's about like minus uh, 100 degrees Celsius, something like that, uh, at nighttime in winter. So Mars is really cold. I'd like to go to Mars. That'd be pretty cool. I wouldn't say no to that. I like to go up into space, right? I'm not going to say no to that either. Um, but yeah, Enceladus was 
on the surface, it wouldn't be habitable. However, we don't think that life would be on the surface unless it just kind of got dumped there and then just died. Um, it would be under the, the surface in the ocean near to those hydrothermal vents. Right, okay. so that, that's really where life would expect, you would expect to find it. How you detect that life, you'd really only be able to look at what's coming out in those plumes and see if there are biosignatures, essentially. Uh, and what exactly those would look like, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. So uh, getting on to Robertson's uh, question, the, the hydrothermal vents on Enceladus are almost certainly the result of tidal flexing. So remember we talked about the moons of the Galilean moons of Jupiter, right? How they're going around Jupiter in ever so slightly uh, elliptical, is that right? Uh, eccentric orbits, there you go, not uh, elliptical. I mean something different. And so those those moons kind of get, they change shape as they do so, right? Because they're being they're essentially a little bit further out from uh, Jupiter, so they're a little rounder, and then they get pulled back in and they're squeezed, and they just kind of do that. And so the same happens with Enceladus. And Saturn is sufficiently massive that it exerts a very strong gravitational pull on uh, its moons. And so the, the warmth and the heat in both Titan and in... Uh, even more so in cellars, as a result of that tidal flexing, resulting in tidal heating. So exactly the same reason why we think there are hydrothermal vents on Europa, uh, but we just don't have evidence of those. They're more theoretical. We do have somewhat convincing evidence of hydrothermal vents on Enceladus. Yeah, and that's really uh, due to the large amounts of methane that's present in the ocean and the water vapor, which is more than what one would expect, right? And also those uh, silicate nanoparticles that are found in the E-ring around Saturn. Um, those two observations can really be best explained by the presence of hydrothermal vents. Cool, okay, so ever so quickly. Um, just to look, have a quick look at the largest moon of Neptune. All right, so this is even further away. Neptune is, uh, I think it's around 30 AU from the sun. So 30 times further from the sun than we are. So it has much less uh, solar radiation uh, than uh, anything going around uh, Saturn does. Sorry, Jimmy, that was just pulling your leg. Um, I'm going to keep banging on about that. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're good. You're good. <laughs> but the so there's a couple of contrasts, right? One is obviously um, the characteristics of the moon, you know, Triton, but also is how little we know about it, right? We know very, very little about Triton. And so when you actually read about it, you know, on uh, NASA's JPL website or whatever, um, a lot of it's more conjecture, like we think it is, or it might be this, because all of these, all of that we have for Triton comes from the Voyager 2 flybys, right? Not even, uh, you know, like a permanent mission around Neptune, which is what uh, Cassini and Galileo were, but just a shink. And it's gone. Actually, what they I watched um, Event Horizon with the family uh, the other day, which was pretty cool because the the spaceship was actually <laughs> in the upper clouds of of Neptune. You did uh, what? You watched that with your family? Yeah. Well, my youngest thought that it would be a fun <laughs> film to watch. <laughs> How old's your youngest? She's eleven. <laughs> 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 and then basically the whole That's family's awesome. like, like yeah. that float for the yeah. whole of the film. You're like, now let's sit down and discuss what happened to this spaceship. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> anyway, my apologies. No, I mean, I think they're only marginally traumatized. I think they'll be fine. You know, give them a few years. Uh, they'll, they'll get better. Um, anyway, 
don't worry, love. She's just over there eating her breakfast. Um, anyway, so uh, we know very little about it, but also one of the cool things is that it's also, as one would expect, a frozen moon, right? Because it is far, far colder. In fact, it's, let me just dig out the, the actual numbers. It's 38 Kelvin, right? So in Fahrenheit, whatever that corresponds to, it's minus 391 Fahrenheit. So this would be even colder than Enceladus, right? Which is all, all, already, you know, a good place to store your pork chops for the winter, right? This is the coldest place that we know of in the solar system, right? It is super, super cold. And uh, this kind of goes back to a question that Jimmy had way back when about uh, nitrogen ice on Pluto right dwarf moon and so um trion is so cold that it's one of the few places in the solar system it's the only moon that is covered in nitrogen ice so this area down here they think is methane ice right so remember titan liquid methane you know uh not yeah titan not triton titan has liquid methane methane rain go a little bit further out in the solar system or actually a fair bit further out and now you have methane ice right so this isn't something that you'd ever encounter on earth right it just doesn't get cold enough um and also uh the rest of it is uh nitrogen ice right so this they call it the cantaloupe region which i think is kind of neat um this whole region over here is uh uh nitrogen ice and ice and uh, nitrogen frost right um they think Is that because it looks like a cantaloupe yeah that's why they <laughs> call it a cantaloupe region that's awesome yeah actually ast astrophysicists and and the like have a fairly decent sense of humor some of the things they call stuff is pretty funny um and uh, these darker patches on the methane ice are most likely uh tholins or equivalent of right so interaction of uv and methane and other stuff and it's also weird because it's one of three places in the solar system that has a nitrogen atmosphere right so uh, i don't know whether they exist at the moment but in the past they think that triton had cryovolcanoes which were spewing out i don't know liquid nitrogen or something i don't i have absolutely no idea right um, I don't even know if they're still active, right? Because again, this is all that we have for Triton. And I don't think we would even have the resolution to see those cryovolcanoes with the Hubble telescope. If you remember how pixelated those images were of Europa, and Europa is 5 AU, right? So that's a sixth of the distance uh, that Triton is. This really, really is like totally out in the boonies as far as it goes in the solar system um so anyway uh trident has a nitrogen atmosphere and that's the same as titan and earth right so why earth has a nitrogen atmosphere and it's so close to the sun and uh the only other places you find nitrogen atmospheres are way way further out uh i've no idea oh yeah ding 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 you know they're probably like, I don't know where Jethro's gone. Um, you know, that's like my bad uh, hillbilly accent. So, um, Tryon is uh, is pretty weird, but again, we don't really know very much about it, right? Because um, all that we've got are these pictures that were taken as Voyager 2 um, is it passed it at some speed, and that's pretty much it. Right, so if you compare how much we know about, uh, you know, Enceladus, Europa, uh, Titan, and compare that to how little we know about Triton, we don't even really know very much about Neptune, right? It's one of the eight planets, right? And we know next to nothing about it. We know that it has storms in the upper atmosphere, and yeah, you know, that's about it, really. You know, so uh, it's. It's not to be underestimated how little we know about this stuff. I just want to see if I can find uh, where was that? I'm going to have to look it up.
Okay, so just get off of that. These things just popping up. So just to remind you, right, and this is a really cool kind of visual aid of how much nothing there is in our solar system, right? We think of our solar system, like planets and moons and like all this kind of stuff. And there's just huge expanses of absolutely nothing, right? Zip, diddly squat. And so um, just to remind you, if you look at it here, right, the sun is kind of where that uh, kind of sparkly bit is, right, in, in the middle. Uh, Jupiter's in that pane over here, if you can see where my cursor is. Uh, Earth is there, I think, or is that Venus? Maybe Earth and Venus. So that's like almost like the inner solar system. Neptune is like way, 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 way out there, right? So when I say this is like, uh, you know, this isn't Tennessee, this is like deepest West Virginia, right? Kind of getting out into like Kentucky and stuff right, in terms of uh, out in the boonies, right, or even if you want to get like super crazy, like northern North Dakota, right, where population density is like negative, right, it's not even a whole number, right, um, and so Triton is out around here, Europa is out, you know, and here, and then uh, about, you know, not even halfway between the two, probably a one third of the distance from the, the sun that Neptune is, is Saturn and uh, Enceladus and, and Titan. So just to give you that, uh, I don't know, uh, it's kind of blow up, get out of it. Stop it doing that. Right, just to blow up further uh, to kind of hammer the point home. It's a very big place with not very much in it, right? And so, uh, it's easy to forget that when we look at all these astonishing pictures and information and even the Huygens probe actually landing on the moon, you know, billions and billions and billions of miles away, that we think it's normal to know that much information. And and really, those are the exception. You know, those Cassini and Galileo uh, probes really changed everything that we knew about the solar system. And there's an awful lot that we still don't know. We still we know very little about uh, Uranus as well, right? They're just very, very distant, unknown places, right? In our own solar system, right? So think about that before next week, we're going to get onto exoplanets, right? Which are literally light years away, right? The closest known one is about four light years from here, right? And I don't even know how many miles there is in a light year. It's quite a lot. Anyway, so uh, what I'm going to do is on Monday, we're going to look at halophiles and psychrophiles. And then I think uh, Wednesday will be, yeah, we'll start getting on to exoplanets, which is super exciting. You get even further into the sci-fi uh, aspect of, you know, science, I guess. And that's pretty much it. Ta -da! So any questions you got, uh, hold on to them over the weekend and uh, bring them to class on Monday. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Likewise. Catch you all later. Oh, yeah. Happy Easter, too. <laughs>